the Anabaptists don't talk about the early church. They, they don't realize that they're following the historic faith closer than these other churches that like to trumpet they are that you know we oh. really we hmm. have a a gem that we don't even make use of David welcome back to the podcast it's fantastic to have you on again it's been probably a good little while since since we've interviewed it, you it, it has and it's it's a pleasure to be back yeah so i mean Probably don't need much of an introduction, but yeah, David Brusso, you've wrote a bunch of books. Uh, you've you've done a lot of different things, as we talked about in one of the last episodes we did with you, was how you were once a Jehovah's Witness and your story of coming out of that. So that'll be linked down below if, if people want to watch that or listen to that episode. But once you went through that that period of of leaving that movement, where did you go from there, and what was that like? Okay, so after leaving Jehovah's Witnesses, um, I went on a quest you know where where is true christianity what does it look like today and um we visited a number of churches we after a few years we ended up in a bible church just a standard evangelical church and with a great great pastor who was just a really really big help to deborah and i he and his wife um reaching out to us helped us kind of across the bridge into you know more orthodox christianity and uh so that was super, um, but yeah, there were some things that church taught that didn't seem to be what the scriptures were teaching, and I wanted to make sure I wasn't just being influenced by my Jehovah's Witness background. So probably the biggest one was once saved, always saved. And it's like, mm -hmm. man, I'm just not seeing that in the scriptures. It seems like there's so many verses that that indicate the opposite. And uh, then that pastor uh, went to Haiti, and we got a new pastor, and so you know, re. Uh, raised the the uh, issue with him, and he was adamant. No, no, this is what Christians have always believed. I thought, well, hmm. that's true. I, I'm not. I don't want to go against the historic faith, you know. But I thought, you know, I'd like to see that for myself. So that's what, you know, I bought a set of the Anti Nicene Fathers, and that's what got me reading the early church. Yeah, just what mm -hmm. did they believe right after the apostles on one saved, all, always saved on the Trinity, on oh, a whole host of subjects. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was very curious. So. Yeah, that, that's how I uh, didn't know it was going to change my life. It was, you know, I was just getting yeah. answers to questions. But yeah, it ended up being life-changing for me. And that was that was fairly soon after you left Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, that would have been, oh, like nine years after I left. Okay, so a little bit of time. You're in a, just a, what, pretty standard American evangelical church before that, or in this time. Yeah, for five years. And before that, like I said, we, we, vis we were just visiting different churches, uh, trying to find something almost... We found a Quaker church that it, uh, interested us a lot. A Quaker, interesting. Yeah, that oh, was wow. that, that was it. it uh, they were called the Evangelical Quakers. So they were Quakers who were okay. not the liberal ones that you <laughs> generally come across. These were more, you know, Bible believing in that. And I was going to college and law school at the time, so it was like I didn't have as much time to devote to the the search until I got out of law school. Mm. And and but during that time, you know, my wife and I were thinking, we thought, yeah, I think the Quaker, I think that's gonna be the, the best our best choice. So wow. on the way home from moving from where I had gone to law school, moving back to our hometown, uh, I called them up and said, uh, yeah, Deborah and I have decided to uh, uh, join you guys. And I, I got the uh, it was a couple that that we had met and I and it was talking to the wife. She said Oh no! I hate to tell you, we just last weekend disbanded. You know. <laughs> oh. Oh, and it was wow. So there's an alternate uh, future possibility there that you would have been a Quaker at least for for a time. It's a possibility. Wow. Yeah. That that. Oh man, did that that hit hard? Yeah. Wow. Oh. So yeah, it sounds like this is a period of like just trying to find like oh where you know <laughs> what kind of church where do we fit in and this is all uh, at, at least initially would have been all very new coming out of Jehovah's Witness and stuff. Um. And just before we we started this episode, actually, we were talking about one of your books, uh, the Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs, um, by Hendrickson Publishers. Uh, and on the back of that book, it identifies you as an Anglican priest. So somewhere we go from where does that come into the <laughs> from story? Quaker to Anglican. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So actually, when the Quakers didn't work out, then it was after that that we joined the the Evangelical Church. Um, um, and then, like I say, I got into the early church, and then I could see. Wow. Yeah. The evangelical. I, I thought, yeah, there's got to be something a bit closer that this mm -hmm. is, there's too many differences. Um, 
not that I, I still appreciated the evangelical church, appreciated the, uh, well, help me restore my faith in God and all that, played a crucial role in my pilgrimage for sure. But uh, yeah, so then I started you know, continuing checking out uh, various churches, came across the Anabaptists during that, that time period, but there weren't any uh, conservative Anabaptist churches near us. So yeah, we were looking in other directions, holiness churches, uh, a number of things. I wrote the book, Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up? And one of my motivations, it wasn't the main one, but but one of them was I was hoping, you know, God would see the book would get somewhere and I'd hear from someone and say, hey, this is exactly what our church believes, you know. And uh, I did get a lot of letters from Anabaptists. So, um, hmm. yeah, I initially was looking that direction. And of course, it's where I eventually ended up. But yeah, <laughs> there was a, uh intermediate period. So, yeah, the Anabaptists really uh, were enthusiastic about the book, and and I was invited to a lot of places to speak, and you know it was mm. really well received, and it was yeah really exciting. And then I wrote the book Common Sense, <laughs> and uh, yeah that had the ex- opposite <laughs> reception, and I yes. got yes yeah, I got really lambasted by not most people, but a in a few quarters yeah I got attacked pretty strongly because of of mm. that book, and and. Uh, so it was, it was very discouraging, and at the same time, um, uh, the book found its way into different Orthodox circles. And so just to be clear, you're, you're getting a lot of, initially you write your first book, everybody's like, wow, this is great, the Anabaptists, yeah. you, you know, so you're in that world and you write the second book, and you're, you're hearing this from some of the Anabaptists, right, where it's like, whoa. Yeah, really well, strong. So I go from hero to villain, I mean, wow. overnight. It was so sudden. I mean, I was stunned. I mean, it's just like... Wow, I, I can't believe it that you know I was so uh, hmm. yeah warmly received, and I'm not saying this in criticism or anything. I'm, I'm just saying you, you know um, obviously um, I wasn't careful in saying some some things in the book that because it was mainly the criticism was mainly misunderstanding the book. Yeah. Uh, was uh, and I hope someday to to revise it. It's on my list. Of Ooh, things. Oh, please do because yeah. I, I read it. We, I have one of the few remaining copies. Yeah. I guess I don't know, but yeah. Um, but yeah, and I, I remember being like, "Whoa, okay, this is." I could see how this could rile some people the wrong way. So you you were on the receiving end of that, and yeah. that that was probably a pretty shaky time. Then. It, it, yeah. So so that really discouraged me. I, I thought, well, I don't seem to be welcome in the Anabaptist world anymore. So mm-hmm. what do I do? And then at the same time. I'm getting all these letters and calls from Orthodox people, you know, mainly people who converted from evangelicals to Orthodox. And they say, oh, this is a fantastic book. Wow. You, you know, you, you you belong in the Orthodox church, you know. And I said, eh, I, I don't think so, you know. Well, yeah, can I come out and talk to you? Well, you know, one guy. And, and uh, so he spent the weekend with us. He was yeah, a very good apologist, you know, for the, the Orthodox faith. I mean, he didn't convince us to go that route, but he certainly made us rethink some some things and and like I say it was just nice being appreciated you, you know and uh when I was being attacked you know by by the the people I thought you know I was going to embrace you know and it's like uh it, it I, I just felt like that door was maybe closed you know it mm. wasn't that I couldn't take criticism I, I just felt like I don't think I'm welcome there anymore you know so um but yeah, the Orthodox was a bit of a leap. We'll maybe talk about that a little yeah. bit later. Why I, I didn't choose them, um, but it got us interested in what I call the ancient churches—that the churches that hmm. can trace themselves back, you know, to the beginning. Historically, it doesn't mean they're teaching the same things, but that you know, that they would have a direct lineage, you know, one way or the other. And uh, on that journey, Dean Taylor was was with us. I know he's been on the. Oh, yeah, no, this, uh, yeah, uh, as yeah. well. So uh, we, we were all we were looking at every kind of. I mean, churches most people have never even heard of, you, you know. But we were looking for ancient churches that maybe had not gotten into um, venerating Mary and you know icons. Th- th- you know, there were a number of things that yeah we were we knew were not early church. We we weren't going to embrace. And so then he discovered this group called the Continuing Anglicans, and they were the conservatives who had broken off from the Episcopal Church here in the U.S., and they were trying to get, and I think it's finally succeeded, but they were trying to unite with the Anglicans in Africa and Asia who tended to be more conservative in those countries. And um, so they were trying to um, yeah, 
get in communion with with them. But anyway, but they broke away from the Episcopal Church. So he said, "Hey, we ought to look into into these guys." You know, I mean, one of two people that we both uh, admired a lot were William Law, um, who was a a writer who influenced John Wesley, and then of course John Wesley was oh. one of our favorites. So, mm -hmm. so and they were both Anglicans. So we thought, well, yeah, I mean, so there's been uh, a lot of good things come out of the the Anglican Church, and uh, um. And one of their things is uh, we liked uh, in their statement of faith, no one shall be required to believe anything that cannot be proven from the Holy Scriptures, you know? So we thought, okay, this is mm. th this th this is good. We can maybe, you know, fit in here. So um, anyway, so yeah, we, we got acquainted with them, and they were, yeah, very welcoming. You know, they, they liked uh, both, her will the real heretics please stand up and common sense, you, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're, we're yeah, very eager to have us join. And we asked if we could come in as a religious society, uh, kind of like the Methodist society that uh, John Wesley had started, uh, you know, we said we our lifestyle is more Anabaptist. You know, we, we would look, I mean, you know, our sisters wore head coverings and, you know, were, you know, dressed modestly and we, we were, you know, embraced non-resistance. I mean, we were, I'd say, Anabaptist in most aspects. And uh, they said, "Yeah, we we uh, th that would be fine. You could uh, draw up your own rule of life, and and uh, if one of you wants to get ordained, yeah, you could. Yeah, then you know, have your own priest there, and you know, and so so this is like a small group that you were meeting with at the time that yeah. was that was doing start up as a house church. So we had a house church okay. that had started off, you know, maybe quasi Anabaptist, and then yeah, wow, uh, yeah." So, so yeah, and then, and then, yeah, like I say, with all the criticism of common sense and other things, yeah, we kind of uh, mm -hmm. started on this journey. So, yeah, we thought, okay, um, uh, the continuing Anglicans look like, yeah, a uh, place we can fit where we still have one foot in the biblical world, you know, we can relate to um, the Protestant world, and and then one, one foot in with the ancient churches, and, and so... Um, so then I and another brother who was with us, uh, Tom Shank, uh, he and I both then started working on getting ordained. I, I forget how long that took, two years or something, you know, our, our, our studies on, on that. But uh, so, um, yeah, I, I eventually got, got ordained. And, and so I was telling you <laughs> before we, we went live, so when I started the project of the Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs, which... That wasn't my title. That was uh, Hendrickson came up with that title. I I had a different one, but I wrote them to see if they would be interested in it. Mm. Um, I picked them because they did a lot of academic um, books. I mean, so many of the books reference reference books, mm -hmm. uh, Christian reference books. And I thought if if they'll print it, it'll help get it into seminaries and uh, lo theological libraries. Which yeah, I, I wanted to have that kind of influence at a a level not just the common. Christian reading it, but but the people in seminary and that sort of thing. So, so when I wrote them, I I just mentioned I'm an Anglican priest. I was at the time, and so yeah, they were interested in the project, and they said, yeah, uh, you know, go for it. And so I did. Well, then, yeah, when I finished the project, I ended up leaving the uh, the Anglicans, and um, I yeah, I never brought it up again. They, they never presented the back cover to me. I didn't know they were going to, that was going to be in the back cover because nothing had ever <laughs> been said. And, uh, I was, I was as shocked as anyone else when I was like, oh no. <laughs> that, and now it's permanently, you know, on, the, on that book. <laughs> yeah. yeah they're, they're, they're not inclined to want to change sure. uh, the, the, the stuff. Well, Cause I didn't know this part of your story and someone gave me a copy back in the day and, and I'm very grateful to have it in my library. Um, which all of y'all should should get a copy, I would say. But um, and I remember flipping it over and reading that, and be like, <laughs> David was a Anglican priest. This is wild. I have to ask you about that because it was. I think it was after I'd interviewed you the first time on on the JWs um, thing. And <laughs> anyway, so I did, and and I heard some of the story. Um, yeah, but that's kind of a wild experience. It doesn't sound like it, it lasted very long, but but no, you were initially there. Like you were an Anglican priest for a bit. You had your yeah. your church group. You did that for a bit. Eventually, that. You, that obviously you're not that anymore. So tell us that part of the story. Okay, so you know, as I said, you know, we were Anglican, but it was more, you might say, working under their umbrella. Since we were a 
religious society, not not monks, but um, like I say, just what the Methodist society had had been. But but we were a little different. We were like I say, basically Anabaptist. So someone looking at us would have thought we were an Anabaptist church. But our service on Sunday, they said the only thing we had to do was use the Book of Common Prayer on Sunday morning, their communion service for Sunday morning. So we use, so we used the Anglican liturgy for, for Sunday morning. So our worship service on Sunday would have looked, and it was very Anglican. We actually uh, grew very much to to enjoy it. We It's a very reverent service, very totally biblical. There was nothing in there that, that was not uh, biblical, well thought out. So yeah, we, we actually enjoyed that part. But then our Wednesday night service was just more like a, you know, evangelical or Anabaptist, you know, prayer meeting, Bible study, uh, you, you know. So, uh, yeah, we were kind of a hybrid <laughs> hybrid group. It was, uh, um, but yeah, we, we were just some of the issues. I mean, the, the issue that made us leave the, the uh, uh, Anglicans, that was a, a very big issue to us, was divorce and remarriage, which mm. uh, we did not want to be, you know, part of a church. Well, we knew they allowed it, but, um, uh, well, what they told us when we asked, I mean, like the Orthodox, I mean, they allow three divorces and, and, and to get remarried three times, which is like, uh, that was, yeah, hmm. one reason we didn't want to go that route. So we talked to the, the Catholics at least held a, a, a pretty strict line, but they've gotten loose on annulment, you know. Hmm. Originally, annulment was only for if you married, like, your sister or, you know, your daughter, something that would be forbidden in the book of Leviticus, then the marriage would be, you could get it annulled or you were supposed to get it annulled because it was an illegal, you know, marriage under church law. Yeah, now they, the Catholic Church has expanded that. Mm. Um, Well, it turned out the Anglican had just pretty much followed the, the Catholics in that respect. So they told me, when I inquired, yeah, we don't allow divorce and remarriage. And we go, oh, okay, well, good. You know, we don't, uh, yeah, it's one hmm. of our convictions. But then we found out, okay, yeah, what they mean is they don't allow, they allow annulment, you know, and then you can get a secular divorce. Oh, okay. And then it was pretty easy to get an annulment, you know, so. Uh, so over time, this this turned into enough that it's like we, we ca- you know, we had to break away from yeah, this. Yeah, it, it became an issue. Well, we found out our bishop was, um, had had an annulment, you know, mm-hmm. and and it was like, okay, this, yeah, we we mm-hmm. we thought, yeah, we're not comfortable with this, so we we broke our affiliation. We stepped, kept meeting as a church for another five years, and we, we mm. kept uh, using the Book of Common Prayer just because we had grown to really like the service. But then we were, you know, we didn't have to. We just, like I say, we enjoyed it. But then we started incorporating various things. Um, that were more early, early Christian and, and, uh, and, and that. So that, that, that's a story there. Um, that's definitely a story. So, so it's like your group didn't fracture and splinter over this. It was like, you, it seems like you stayed together fairly well, but it's like, we can't be part of this larger, you know, yeah. church group. Uh, we, we, over lost, that issue. We, we did lose some families, but mm-hmm. uh, enough remain that, yeah, we were able to carry on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So that's, that is an interesting window into, into a different, a diff- I'm not very familiar, honestly, with with Anglican or really just the, di- the different what I call I don't know if this is the right word, but you know the, the high church forms, um, Orthodox, Catholic, things like that. And I think that's I think it's pretty important to understand what that's like. Um, and so one of the immediate questions I had when I was working through the script and we were emailing some about this, um, what about this whole thing of apostolic succession? Um, and were you attracted to that? Did you find that oh that that's interesting and like explain what that is first off and and let's let's dive into that a bit. Yeah, so that would have been maybe one of the big attractions that we um we as a house church like I say we would have started off more anabaptist free radical whatever you'd want to to uh you know describe us and but as different ones in the group um you know Others started reading the early Christians, which was up to that point, you know, I had read them and then I was sharing with other people, but I didn't have anyone I could really converse with. But now, yeah, there were other people in our group reading it. And yeah, some of them got interested in apostolic succession. They 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 see the term, you know, succession of bishops and things like that uh, in some of the writings. And so, 
yeah, we got it started looking into that, and and um, yeah, I got convinced that okay, there's something to this. Never to the point that I felt like oh, other people aren't Christians or their communion isn't valid, or or you know if if, uh, if they didn't have apostolic succession. But I thought maybe it did help bring about more unity that there was mm-hmm. some value to it. So that was, I think, one of the things we were um, seeking. So, uh, and of course, I got ordained. I've got a, it's probably back here uh, somewhere, um, a big long scroll. And my ordination supposedly goes back oh, to the Apostle John. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so that's what we're saying when we're saying the apostolic succession, at least in the sense that you had with, with the Anglican Church. Like they, they actually made that, like actually had a scroll with, yeah. Wow. Going all the way back to the Apostle. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Man, if we could take that out, I would I would love to see that. <laughs> Actually, I would love to see that. Um, so they, yeah, I mean, they they were really bought into that as like this is this is one of the oh yeah key they, would, they would feel that's very yeah very important. I mean, another reason we chose the um, Anglican the Anglican Church in America, the Episcopalian was never a state church in a national sense. It was never a uh, some of the states, it would have been um, a uh, an official church of like Virginia or something like that, but it was never like the National Church of the United States or something like that. Now the Anglicans in England were were definitely a state church, yeah. But here in this country, um, we felt like okay, uh, yeah, we felt like a closer connection than we would have been comfortable with, but we felt like okay, at least this is much further away. Um, and yeah, today the Episcopal Church, you know, would not believe in church and state being one and, and that kind of thing mm-hmm. here in the United States, you know. Well, well, back on the so so back to so you mentioned apostolic succession as as something initially it seemed oh this is you know one of the this is a positive, um, and as you get into this uh, this church group, you're starting to see some more of the negatives uh, um, with, yeah. with some of these different things. Um, somewhere along the line, I'm guessing apostolic succession was not as important anymore, which I know this that is a really big deal to a lot of these different church yeah, groups, it is, right? it is. Somewhere along the line, is like, oh, actually, maybe this isn't as important. What changed your mind? Okay. What changed it, there? It wasn't that it wasn't as important. It was that it's not what the early Christians teach. That's what, yeah, see, you, hmm. you, see, the interesting thing is when I originally read the early Christians on my own, I was not convinced of apostolic succession in the way that it is taught. Of course, I didn't know what it mean. I'd, I'd heard the expression apostolic succession, and then I see they talk about succession of, of bishops and all of that, and I thought, oh, well, this is maybe what it's meant. But no, then we, when we got around the Anglicans and the Orthodox and all that, what they mean by apostolic succession is, yeah, you aren't validly ordained unless, yeah, you've been ordained by someone who was ordained by someone who, who you can trace yourself all the way back Oof. to one of the apostles who ordained. And so you've got this kind of line that this, you know, chain of apostolic succession is passed through on the ordination, okay? And so you're not really validly ordained. And so therefore it's not, I don't know, the Anglicans would not say this, but the Orthodox, it's not a valid communion, you know? Oh, uh, that okay. you're having in your church if mm-hmm. the minister who is presiding, you know, is does not ha- was not ordained through apostolic succession. But what the early church, but what they're talking about is who ordained whom. I realized it was when I was working on the dictionary. Okay, so I'm I'm starting over afresh. I go to the Anti Nicene Fathers. I start in chronological order from the beginning. Okay, okay, and and I'm just writing these quotes on a jillion subjects, you, you know, uh, anything I thought was important. And, you know, since I was Anglican, I was trying to be very neutral on both from the Catholic side, small C Catholic, and the Protestant side. I, I was, you know, just w- w- what do they say? And I was thinking of topics that were of interest to Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, topics that were interested mm-hmm. of interest to Anabaptists, to Baptists, wh- whatever, you know, just um, uh, just things that would be of interest. So, uh, I had, you know, one of them was apostolic succession. So I'm looking at the quotes and I'm realizing, okay, they're not talking about who ordained whom. When they their list of uh, succession is a list of who followed whom in office, not who ordained whom. So like, hmm. um, normally a person stayed in office till they died. So they okay. didn't ordain their successor. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with 
the laying on of hands mm-hmm. by someone who's been, you know, someone got zapped by the apostles and then they can zap the next person, that kind of thing. <laughs> They're not talking sure. about that at all. And the only reason they even bring it up at all is because the Gnostics, um, they they were they, they had you know these weird strange doctrines. Uh, I mean, so strange that you can hardly call them Christian. I mean, it, it's like the God of the Old Testament is not the same God as the God of the New Testament, and they rejected most of the books of the New Testament and, and stuff like that. But anyway, Jesus never came in the flesh. For you know, anyway. Their teachers were saying, "Oh well, yeah, I was a companion of Paul, and and you know, uh, we yeah, we got this from the apostles." And so Irenaeus's response was, "Well, our churches, we can show the succession of the bishops that we can trace ourselves to the apostles." He's talking about the doctrine, you know, that yeah. this person got his doctrine from the apostles, and and then this one got it from that guy, and 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 all of that. Um, yeah, where's your list? Where did you, you came from? Nowhere, you, you know. You just popped up and you come up with this doctrine. We can trace ourselves back to the apostles, but he's not talking about ordination. That yeah, this made your ordination valid or invalid. It was that yeah, you're carrying on the historical faith. It's being handed down from the apostles, and it's a good argument. I mean, Irenaeus wrote about 170, 180, somewhere in there. It's a very good argument. Just seventy years after the Apostle John died. Now, it breaks down when you get, you know, three, four hundred, a thousand, fifteen hundred years. Well, yeah, you're not necessarily still carrying it on. In fact, you can yeah. show very positively you're not teaching what they taught back back then. So I saw that when I worked on the Dictionary of Very Christian Beliefs, that, okay, yeah, this teaching that the Catholic Church, the Orthodox, the Anglicans, that they have on Apostolic Succession, it's just... It's not what the early Christians are saying. It's, yeah, that, that's totally false. It's invalid. And so, yeah. So from that point, yeah, it didn't, it, it was of no um, particular importance to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, not everyone in our church, I had not tried to necessarily convince them. Some of them still felt fairly strong about it. And, and so I, I did not want to split the church over. You know, we had a nice, a nice group there. I mean, eventually, I guess I did make an issue of it, and and, and it did kind of create a, uh, a a stir in the in in the church. And then and at that point is when we broke up because it's like, okay, if if apostolic succession isn't important, which it's it's not, and it's it's not even valid. I mean, I realized looking at my scroll, <laughs> it's like this is fake. I mean. It's purporting to say who ordained whom. Well, we don't even have a record. Their record is who followed whom in office. There's no record of who did the ordaining. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So, and and there's hmm. big gaps in the historical record that they've filled, and they've they've. I just realized this isn't even hmm. valid. That, you know, that's so ironic though that you're kind of coming to to terms with this while while an Anglican priest and while you're actually writing the one book that identifies you as such. Yeah. And and in that process of re re going through the early church fathers you know, and the Nicene fathers is actually when you started reevaluating this and saying, wait, I'm actually reading this wrong. Or like, I, I, yeah. I got this wrong. Yeah. That's fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. It was a number of other doctrines. We won't go into them now, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was a learning experience for me because I'd never had that luxury. See today, people who are researching the early church, well, one thing now it's available electronically. So you can yeah. do word searches, you can do things like that. There's AI stuff where you can do topical searches now you, I mean, back then there was nothing. There were some Catholic source books that you know had different topics, and then they mm-hmm. had their proof quotes. But yeah, that was it. There wasn't the dictionary of early Christian belief. So yeah, when I wanted to research something, I just had my notes, and they were just by writer, wow. not by topic. You know, so you had just brute force like go through. I mean, the set is however many books yeah. is in the Ananising Fathers oh. or whatever it yeah. is you're studying. Yeah, yeah, that makes so, sense. So yeah. I mean, I would have done the Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs for my own research if I hadn't done it for publication. I was just like, I hate that I don't have all of the needed quotes, particularly in chronological order, you know, so Mm -hmm. you can see like, whoa, they've all been saying this and now they're suddenly saying something different. See, I I didn't have that option. I just, it was a kind of a jumbled sort of thing. And and so, yeah, it it busted a lot of myths uh, (laughs) doing the dictionary. And I'd say by the end of it, yeah, I realized I still appreciated a lot of things about um, Anglican worship, um, about... um, 
the ancient churches, you, you know, that some of the things they're accused of uh, as being false actually is genuinely early Christian, but then a lot of stuff is definitely something that was added on through the ages. Uh, so I'm not sorry for the experience, but mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I feel like it's made me a better, well-rounded Christian, but um, I definitely saw the Anabaptists as um, the lifestyle I saw in the early church, which rereading them again and, and compiling the dictionary, it, it just stands out so much, their emphasis on living the Sermon on the Mount, you know? Hmm. And there's so few churches, I mean, the Anabaptists, the Bible-believing Quakers, which there aren't very many of those, I mean, that's about it. I, I mean, that, you know, are centered on, we live, we take the Sermon on the Mount as a way of life, not as an ideal that's unattainable, which is what mo most evangelicals teach, that either it's a different, it, it applies to a different dispensation, or it's mm -hmm. unattainable. Jesus gave it to just show we can't live by laws, you know? Uh, I, I hear yeah. that a lot. Yeah, and so out of this experience, you're actually coming back around to that and saying, wait, this is, this is, a, real, this is a core piece of yeah. what I want. Um, and so from there, what did you say? Because when we at the beginning of this interview, you were saying how the second book you published, Common Sense, kind of ostracized you in some ways from the Anabaptist world, or however you want to say it. Um, it you went through this Anglican thing, and now as you've given up on apostolic succession or seen it's not as important, did you find yourself heading back to the Anabaptist world then at, at that point? Like, where does the story go from there? Yeah, so at that point, um, we actually, the our... Uh, well, I, I call it a house church, but by this time we were meeting in a church building. Um, we disbanded, and I didn't think, I didn't, I honestly thought when I demonstrated that apostolic succession was not uh, what the early Christians taught, and it wasn't biblical, and it wasn't essential, that, yeah, then we'd just carry on, you know, and um, maybe it would free us up, we could affiliate, uh, we talked about affiliating with charity or something like, like that, but... Um, yeah, it turned out it, it just, wow, mm. it kind of threw people off. People didn't know what they wanted to do. So, yeah, the, the church ended up just, fortunately, it was very amicable. I mean, you know, there was no friction or anything, but we just realized we didn't have a clear vision anymore. And um, uh, Dean Taylor was hoping maybe we we could uh, join charity. We, we invited Danny Keniston to come down and, and mm -hmm. uh, do a, a weekend of revivals and, and stuff like that. Um, but... Yeah, the group decided not to go that way, and and like I say, just everyone had something different that they wanted to pursue church-wise, you know. And so uh, Dean and, and Tanya, they moved up to Pennsylvania and, and uh, joined charity. And so, yeah, so then, yeah, I was, my family was uh, like, okay, you know, what do we do? Um, for a while, we just had house church at, at home, just, just us. I wasn't real eager to get another house church going. It's, mm -hmm. it, it is a, it's a hard struggle. You know, house churches don't tend to have long lives, you know, and I did appreciate yeah. the Anabaptists. They've kept this thing going 500 years. That, that is not easy. You know, I mean, there's been a lot mm. of perfectionist, what I call perfectionist churches. I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean, churches that are centered on, Hey, we live by what the scriptures say. We don't, we don't water it down and that, but yeah, most of them don't last more than a generation if they last that long, you know. And there, I mean, there's been wow. so many you could you could fill pages with all of these different groups that had these wonderful ideals, and like you say, you know, when their founder dies, that's 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 the end of them, or or mm -hmm. or often they don't even last that long. And like, okay, a group that can last 500 years, I I, I like the stability, knowing that mm -hmm. they would be here for my family and my. Um, uh, children, grandchildren, um, but yeah, there was the issue of the early church that that uh, uh, that was um, how how I was I was going to cross that that mm -hmm. that bridge. But uh, yeah, maybe that would be better for another interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh, it's an important part, you know. Where yeah, you so it's it's a bit. Every, everybody's path in life is is a little different, you know. And and as you've bumped into some of these things and it's like, wow, this, th that actually didn't work. And you didn't, you found yourself coming back to the Anabaptists, you know, even after initially there was, there was some, I don't know what you would call it after that second book, um, and some challenges and that that's actually something I've been thinking about a lot when people go through things like this, it is very easy to just say, you know what, fine, I'll, I'm just out of here. I don't ever want to be a part of this again. And the fact that you, you know, you, you did 
come back and say, hey, there is something really valuable here that I want. Um, and you come back and now I guess you know, you're part of the Anabaptist and you've been that way for quite a while now. Um, yeah, I, I think that's significant. Yeah. Um, so like I say, working on the dictionary, I realized that the center of early Christianity, what they talk about the most when they present the gospel to the pagan Romans, I mean, the thing they talk about the most uh, in addition to the person of Jesus, his incarnation in that, is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, yeah, how he taught us to live. And that none of the ancient churches, the Catholic, the Orthodox, the Anglican, the, the Coptic, I mean, any of those, they don't even come close. I mean, mm. th that doesn't even begin to describe how most of them live. Now, there have been outstanding Roman Catholics, there have been outstanding Anglicans, you know, I've mentioned William Law, you know, uh, John Wesley, who, who lived these, you know, really godly lives, you know. Uh, same with the Orthodox. I mean, there have been individuals, but as a people, no, that doesn't describe them. They wouldn't even claim, yeah, we li we live this Sermon on the Mount. And and so, yeah, the, I realized the Anabaptists don't talk about the early church. They don't realize that they're following the historic faith closer than these other churches that like to trumpet they are, that, you know, we oh. really, we hmm. have a, a gem that we don't even make use of um, <laughs> that, you know, like, wow, yeah, hmm. we, we can really say, hey, we are following the historic faith. Now, there are a few doctrinal differences, but I mean, I can only think of really two main ones, you know, and as far as theology, you know, and so even theologically, the view of hmm. salvation, the 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 view of um, uh, you know, once saved, always saved, um, our our general not putting the emphasis on theology. The the early church, as I said, their emphasis was on Christian living. That in itself is a significant part of early Christianity. That it was not doctrinity. It, it was not built on you. You've got a, this long you know list of things. The the Apostles' Creed was all you had to believe theologically, which every group that calls themselves Christian just about believes the Apostles' Creed. And so, yeah, just the fact that the Anabaptists are not big theologians actually, yeah, brings them closer to primitive Christianity, you know, that, yeah, that wasn't their emphasis either, trying to dissect these, you know, complex doctrines and that sort of thing. And so, I, yeah, I, I realized... Um, I, I maybe did a poor job of kind of presenting things in common sense. Um, I, I could definitely have presented it better. Um, but yeah, the, the Anabaptists don't realize, yeah, that, that they've got these, you know, hmm. fantastic ties that other churches who want to trumpet it, like the Catholic Church, I mean, they're nowhere near as close as the Anabaptists are when you take into account the whole picture, not just, you know, certain certain doctrines, you know. So there's a lot of others out there that are reading the early church writings, Ananicene Fathers, the Patristics, so forth. And that is taking them to some of the more high church traditions, you know, Anglican, Eastern Orthodox, Orthodox, whatever, uh, Catholic. Um, you've been reading these for quite a long time. You've written many books about it. And you ultimately went the Anabaptist route, and you've said a little bit of why that is, but like, how are they reading these texts different than you? And, or what are you doing that's different than they are, I guess, when you read this material? Yeah, so th the problem is, and, you know, I'm working to, you know, change this within the um, Anabaptist world, and it, and it is changing. I mean, they, uh, a lot more people now, uh, I've found just uh, in many places, are, are reading the early Christians, are becoming more familiar with the, the historic faith, and um, yeah, realize it's not in any way incompatible with um, Anabaptists, and that it it uh, fits us closer. Uh, what happens to people is exactly what happened, you know, to me with common sense. Now they they don't get attacked the, the way I did, but the Anabaptists, because yeah, generally throughout history they didn't read these writings. Um, they've never, you know, thought about them. So, yes, there are uh, views the early Christians had that are not Anabaptist views, but, yeah, there's an awful lot of views there that are not Orthodox or Catholic either, you know. Um, but 
the ones who generally do the reading of the early Christians, I, like, you know, most, you, you know, I've got a bookshelf just, you know, laden with all kinds of uh, writings and things about the early church. Well, almost all of them, um, the tr- if it's a early Christian writing, the translator is invariably usually Roman Catholic, uh, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. Lutheran, not usually Orthodox, but occasionally. Um, books about them tend to be, again, it's either Anglican, Catholic, Orthodox, something like, like that. They've made that their field. Uh, in the Catholic Church, you know, their doctrine, their teaching, official teaching, is doctrine developed. Um, and so God gave the church the authority to develop doctrine. So, yeah, they can read Justin Martyr and all that, and, hmm. okay, he said this or that, and that wasn't wrong in his day, because that's all God had revealed up to that point. But now we understand hmm. things a little better, you know? I mean, like Tertullian points out, you know, Mary's failings and, and you know, her sins and things like that, and they would say, well, okay, yeah, they didn't have a clear understanding of Mary that later then the church defined that, you know, Mary Whoa. was sinless and and things like that. So for hmm. the Catholics, it's not intimidating because, yeah, well, we've just developed beyond that. Now, the Orthodox would say, oh, we haven't changed anything, which at least the Catholics, I'll give them credit, they're honest. I mean, you know, that, yeah, it's developed. Yeah, we're not claiming that, th- yeah, we're practicing the same thing they were back then. I didn't realize that. Okay, yeah. that's interesting, but you're saying the Orthodox are yeah. not that way. Yeah, they say, oh, no, we haven't changed anything. <laughs> and oh, okay. like, they, they, I heard all the time from them, yeah, Luke painted the first icon, and it's like, Come on. I mean, just, you know, throughout total legends and, you know, it just, I don't know when that developed, you know, that one, <laughs> you know, long after Constantine. But, um, yeah, and so they can throw out proof text from the early church that makes it look like, um, oh, see, this fits with what we teach. I mean, you can proof text the Bible, why there's so many different denominations, to make it say almost anything, and you can proof text the early Christians, and people who just look at those proof texts, and they're being enticed, well, see, yeah, this is the, the historic faith. And on the other end, see, up until the present time, and, you know, like I say, it's changing, but Anabaptists haven't been saying, well, no, see, you can sh- go back and show that what, what what we practice is what the early church did, you know? Um I mean, there would be a couple things I wish the Anabaptists would maybe be a little bit more uh, open on, um, uh, on a couple of doctrinal issues where what the early church taught is so literally what the New Testament teaches. I mean, you know, it it, uh, was an overreaction against the Catholic Church, but like I say, there's only a couple of doctrines that, that really are like that. For the Orthodox, you've got all these problems with Mary and icons that, you know, the the early church, you know, it's definitely nobody was sinless. I mean, there's no teaching of uh, Mary, you know, immaculate conception, or that she was born without sin, uh, or that she is, you know, ascended to heaven. Or the Orthodox don't say uh, we don't say she assumed was assumed. It. They have a little twist on everything, but it's basically <laughs> the same thing. She went to heaven. They both say she's the queen of heaven. They both pray to Mary. They both, you know, she's the most exalted figure. I mean, none of that's in the early church. You, do, you read the early church, I mean, you go a whole volume and there's hardly any mention of Mary. I, I mean, she's not this central figure. Hmm. It's just like the New Testament. After the book of uh, the first or second chapter of Acts, I guess the second chapter of Acts, she's never mentioned again in the whole New Testament, you, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it's people taking the early church and proof texting things, and because most people aren't well-read, yeah, th- th- they can't. They can't answer. It makes me think when I was a Jehovah's Witness, the easiest people to convert were were Catholics because they didn't know their Bibles at all. You know, it was a closed book to them, so it was very easy as Jehovah's Witness. And we could, you know, take the Bible, show them this proof text. And, you know, the Bible says this. The Bible says that. Oh wow! And yeah, yeah, they didn't know anything. They they couldn't, you know, d- defend themselves. And it's the same way. You know, so few people know mm-hmm. the, the uh, early Christian writings, so that it's like, oh, uh, maybe this is historic. But you know we were we were talking at uh, uh, at lunch about this that um, it always alarms us when someone leaves the Orthodox the uh, Anabaptist and goes Orthodox yeah, yeah. or Roman Catholic. I've known a few people, you know, have gone Roman Catholic from either Anabaptist or from Kingdom churches. 
But, you know, maybe the ones I'm aware of, I could party, you know, maybe 20 people or something like that. The number who become evangelical would, would be in the thousands who've left, you know, either the Amish or one of the Mennonite groups, you know, have maybe gone to a more liberal Mennonite church, and then they just kind of, you know, just slowly drift, and then, yeah, they join some evangelical church. We're, we're not as shocked. We're disappointed, you, you know. Uh, you usually hear, oh, yeah, they're not playing anymore, but but uh, uh, people aren't shocked by that. But that's by far the greater danger, which is one of the things I've been trying to get, get out. We, we, we're we worried about, yeah, this dozen or so people, 20 people or so who, who you know, read the early church and go down the wrong trail. But, you know, what about the hundreds who go down the wrong trail hmm. for one thing? Because they don't, they're not founded in the historic faith. And, and um, we worry about, yeah, the, the few chickens escaping out this, this little hole and the, the big... <laughs> The the gate is open and you know hundreds are going out the the, the other direction. But mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. anyway, so is this is this a thing of um, which of the early church fathers they're reading? I know you you hinted that a little bit before we were started recording. Is that some of the these Orthodox Catholic scholars are they maybe reading l later writings? Um, and and you your specialty is the Ananicene fathers, which is right. the first you know what one hundred to like three hundred eighty or something like that. Three twenty five, yeah, yeah, to three twenty five. Um, is that some of what's going on here too? Like, are y'all reading different texts, or are they? Yeah, again, I'm yeah, just so trying to, to parse that out. So the, the Catholic Church, the Orthodox, their fathers. I mean, they quote, they'll quote Ignatius or you know Justin Martyr or Ir Irenaeus when it suits them, you know. And you can prove text. You know, you can take an Orthodox doctrine and you can find a sentence from Irenaeus that makes it fit that. Mm -hmm. Well, likewise, you can take Jehovah's Witness doctrine and everything they teach, you can find a verse in Scripture mm -hmm. that supports it. I mean, you know, anyone can do that. That's that's kind of child's play, you know. I mean, if you can prove text the New Testament, which is, what, I don't know how many uh, <laughs> words. Yeah. Well, when you talk about 10 volumes of writing, yeah, you've got a lot of stuff to pull proof text, you know, from. Plus, you're dealing with... Uh, fallible people. So even if somebody actually said that, and if you're not taking at it out of context, that still doesn't mean it's right. If it, if you can't base it on Scripture, the fact that Irenaeus says something, well, okay. I mean, he's a human like you and I, and maybe he's wrong on that that point. It doesn't, yeah, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. make it right that one of them says it. Your your foundation has to be the the New Testament. But um, so yeah. Like the Orthodox, their big teachers would be John Chrysostom, who I like. I mean, most of the things he he says, I, I think he's a, he's a, a good expositor of Scripture. Uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, mm -hmm. Basil, um, I think those are the their their big three. Mm -hmm. Which, but those would be later. Yeah, so those are right? all after, they're all post Nicene. So the Orthodox Church sees, in fact, they, Constantine is officially one of their saints. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. The, the, Interesting. The, the, yeah, the Catholic Church. I did not know that. Yeah, the Catholic Church doesn't view him as a villain, but they don't make him a saint. Wow. But yeah, he's actually a saint. They have a, hmm. a feast date to uh, Constantine, so they don't see the gigantic upheaval when you take the kingdom of God and meld it with the kingdoms of this world, and that everything started changing. You know, after the the Council. Really, it started before the Council of Nicaea. But yeah, once you get state and church joining together, yeah, it, it was just a few decades before Christians were going to war, originally against pagans, but then pretty soon it was Christians fighting Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, a very short time before you have persecution, Christians persecuting other Christians. I hear it had been the pagans persecuting Christians or, or the unbelieving Jews, and now it's Christians persecuting Christians. And through the ages, I mean, the number of Christians who were put to death by uh, the pagan Romans just hardly compared with how many were put to death by the Orthodox and, and Catholic churches. I mean, it, it just, yeah, that, that became such a horrible, just uh, so contrary to the kingdom of God, you know, of persecute. I mean, and again, the early church is so strong. We, we do not persecute other people. We do not persecute heretics. You know, we don't, you know, we put them out of the church and it stops at that point. So see, there's all those kind of doctrines that the Orthodox never bring up, yeah. and they want to focus on on things, you know, like say a proof text here. I just did a series that I know the Orthodox 
apologists don't like, but on just believer's baptism, um, you know, they, they, they like to present it like, Ooh. oh, well, see, the early church was yeah. in infant baptism. Well, certainly it was practiced at least in the third century on, but believer's baptism is what you see up until that point. And even when you see infant baptism, uh, I think the evidence would indicate believer's baptism was still just as common or maybe more common. It, it looks like clearly in the 4th century, and I think most infant baptizers would acknowledge that the 4th century, believer's baptism is the main practice. So, um, yeah, so we, we kind of let them, oh, well, infant baptism, okay, that's the early church. Well, no, we can take a stand. The early church has a strong witness for believer's baptism. We are following the historic faith. Interesting, because isn't that that sounds pretty controversial? Depending on who hears you say that, because be like, oh no, that that's not what the early church taught. Whatever, whatever. Which I guess in that case, we have to do a whole another episode on it. But you said you did a series on this. Yeah. So, so is that something people can check out? And, yeah. So and there's it's, it's on Scroll Publishing now. Uh, there's four CDs. Okay. Uh, it goes. It starts with the New Testament, um, and that's one of the problems with people who go Orthodox. You got to stick with the New Testament. You know, mm -hmm. the early church, um, the early Christian writings are our best commentary on the New Testament. But when they start, when people start using them as an authority in their own right, you know, yeah. then they're dangerous because they're fallible humans and they would have never wanted to be used that way. You know, they're just trying to expound the New Testament and, mm -hmm. and we have a witness of what they believe, but they weren't trying to write things for oh, this is what everyone should do for, you know, ages to, to come or anything like that. But, yeah, always stick with the New Testament. And, and so that's where I start with the New Testament. Do we see anything about infant baptism there? You know, I, I, I go through the book of Acts, all so many baptisms, every time, you know, it says they believed, they believed. You know, even if it's a whole household, it said they all believed, you, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then we look at the second century, you know, any mention there? I mean, we, we go through quote after quote they you know oh wow so hmm. yeah so mm -hmm. then we get mm -hmm. to where we you do start getting some clear evidence of infant baptism and and first it's generally emergency baptism an infant is dying and and so uh, a lot not everyone did it but a lot of parents like to baptize them they could feel like okay they you know were, were baptized when they were they were buried uh, no teaching that the child was lost if they weren't baptized, but yeah, you start seeing emergency baptisms. But again, you see emergency baptisms of people 12, 19, in their 20s. So it's obvious they weren't baptized as infants or they wouldn't be getting an emergency baptism, you know, when they're 12 or 19. You know, yeah. it's always because they, they have some fever, they're about to die, and they get, you know, this emergency, you know, deathbed kind of baptism. So even that practice shows that. The only reason even those infants got baptized was because they were going to die. Otherwise, yeah, they would not have been baptized. So actually that practice shows that believer's baptism was the norm. Because, again, if all ba if all babies were baptized from the start, then you wouldn't have to do these emergency ones. You know, mm -hmm. the fact you were doing it shows that, yeah, they didn't get baptized, you know, when, when they were a newborn, and you're baptizing them at the year one or something like that, age one, you know, one year because they, you know, are are dying and, and the, the the parents want them, you know, baptized as a Christian, you know, before mm -hmm. they're buried. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I approve of of that practice, but I don't know that sure, there's any but... tremendous harm in it either. Well, wow, that's that's so interesting though, because because yeah, I think that that has been one of the critiques I've heard about your work over the years. It's like, oh well, he's selectively reading or you know early church writings. He's missing one, which one of them that someone did mention specifically was that issue of baptism, which I did not know you'd done that series. So I'm gonna definitely text that person and be like, hey, check out this series. Yeah. Let me know what you think, because because they were like. They weren't necessarily agreeing, disagreeing, but they're just like, I think that's a blind spot that, you know, uh, Berceau needs to, you know, whatever, he needs to, to address that. And it's really interesting to hear you say that because, yeah, I know there's definitely people out there that are, yeah, maybe they're reading a different era of church history or they're reading it in a very yeah. different way. And I think that's, that's and important. And they're being influenced. To, I mean, even us, we wouldn't have gone down the journey we did in mm -hmm. Texas, but like I say, the only source books as we had outside the Anti-Nicene Fathers, which again, that's a, a, a lot to try to find. What did they say about this? Were these books published by Roman Catholics that sure. yeah, doc, you know, topically had this laid out. So you see only these quotes that fit the Roman Catholic doctrine. And yeah. we didn't have anything, you know, even when I did the dictionary, and I don't regret it, I made it as theologically neutral as I could. I didn't 
you know, and I was in a good position to do that because, like I say, Anglicans is kind of a bridge between Protestant and Catholic. And, and um, but I just, I wanted to be honest that people could find the quotes there. Uh, but I didn't just selectively put ones in that fit, who, whomever. I mean, but like I say, all the other people, yeah, their stuff is always just the stuff that 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 fits them. And so, yeah, it's convincing if if you don't want to look at the broad thing. So, yeah, people who think I'm I'm only selectively quoting, I, I think it's just the other way around. I've I've tried to, <laughs> yeah, put everything in there and mm -hmm. acknowledge, you know, what uh, mm -hmm. what is there. They've never talked to me about the subject of infant baptism, so they just think they know what I believe. Because <laughs> I never I never did any CDs on that. I mean, this is the first time. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Here, I, actually, I yeah, I didn't know that that had been done. I I think what I'm sensing from you is um maybe reading the whole trunk, like all volumes of the Ananicene Fathers, not just a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and maybe this person's writing. But you're saying, like, get the whole thing, get immersed in that world, and you've read them multiple times. It's interesting because we were looking at your shelf before we started recording, and you're, you're like, yeah, we had to, like, rewrap these to hold them together because you can't even read the spines, like, falling apart, you know. And um, you have been with these texts quite a lot. Um, am I getting it? Correct. Do you think that's that has something to do with it? Like this reading the the whole chunk instead of little pieces. Yeah. Is that what you're encouraging people to do? Well, if if they have have the time to uh, uh, to do that, that's definitely. Yeah. Don't rely. Be very careful of yeah people who are just giving you proof texts, and um, yeah, smooth apologists who who uh, you know whatever. I mean, just mm. yeah. Ask yourself when you read the New Testament. Uh, yeah, to just just read it without any. You don't have to read it as an Anabaptist. Just read it. Do you see infant baptism? Do you see the veneration of Mary in there? Do you see people mm -hmm. praying to icons? Do you see Christians going to war? Do you see Christians, you know, holding political office and and ruling? I mean, you know, what 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 do you see in the New Testament? You, you know, that's really yeah. That's a good point. Like and. Yeah, you would mentioned this a little earlier about some of the people in the Anabaptist world changing and going to Orthodox, Catholic, Anglican, what have you. And it seems like I've noticed that more in the last few years than than before. I don't know if um, that could just be me, but I wonder if that's a bit of a trend and a little bit of an up uptick. And I know you said, you know, hey, like let's keep things in proportion here. You know, we have a yep. lot more going the evangelical right. American fundamentalist route, yep. whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, and and I agree with you. I know a lot more that have gone that route. But I still wonder about that. Why do we have some of those people that are going to the Orthodox groups, like basically, what are they seeing there that they're not getting in their Anabaptist churches? Which is obviously a very broad, and we can never fully answer that. But I'd be really curious if you if you have input on that. Yeah, I don't know for each person what you know what all of their motivation is. You know, because I haven't I haven't talked to uh, to all of them. I mean, one person who uh, he was not Anabaptist, but he was in uh, some kingdom circles. Uh, was a convert, it, you know, from, I don't even know what his background was, but um, uh, he went Roman Catholic, and he emailed me, you know, and to just try to talk me into going Roman Catholic, but his argument was miracles, you, you know, uh, that, you know, Roman Catholics have all of these miracles or claim miracles, and of course the Pentecostals, that's their, you know, claim to fame, and that was one thing I know when the Orthodox people came and talked to me, yeah, yeah they always talked about all these miracles and, and this or that, that uh, I, you know, I, I went to see some of the things they talked about that, that I certainly didn't see any miracle there, but, <laughs> but, but whatever. Um, it's a larger trend in society. So hmm. um, just like there's been a resurgence in the last 40, 50 years of Calvinism, I mean, it was kind of seemed to be dying out in the 60s and 70s. I mean, it was hard to find somebody who was a diehard Calvinist in back in those days. Uh, I mean, th th there were obviously thousands around, but I mean, just in the circles I was in, you know, when I was evangelical and stuff, you didn't, you didn't find too many five-point Calvinists, you know, and like there's been this, you know, um, resurgence. Well, likewise, there's been um, a lot more people have gotten interested in the Catholic and the Orthodox churches. So... It uh, it's Protestants. If there's a few Anabaptists, that they're just part of a larger trend of Protestants who are, 
get burned out on Protestantism and then, you know, look into Catholicism and um, or Orthodoxy. And ironically, most of the time, the ones who are the great apologists, they have some very excellent apologists, both the Catholics and the Orthodox. They're nearly always converts, you know, which I always find interesting. So, you mean converts to that particular to that, yeah, orthodoxy or whatever it is? Exactly. They're, they're nearly oh. always their background is. Protestant. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, okay. it's very interesting that uh, how come yeah your native born people hmm. you know aren't aren't the uh, the, the apologists because they're not like even getting the Orthodox Study Bible, which was you know finally a good translation of the uh, Septuagint in, into English. Um, there were certainly a lot of you know native orthodox behind that but there were a lot of the converts that were i know had been pushing for this from the time they came into the orthodox world you know we need the septuagint translated in english i mean we read it in greek in the church or whatever and we and in the orthodox church all these centuries never bothered to translate it into english even though that is their old testament never Whoa. bothered you know no, I did not realize that. Yeah, it's 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 just. No, that seems a little bit odd. Yeah, it's it's just. Hmm. It, yeah, it's, it's it's so these converts have yeah been been very effective that way, but as I remind people, for every Protestant who converts to Catholicism, there's probably five hundred Catholics who become Protestants. You know, and and the and sure. the other way around. So again, keeping things in proportion. It's not like, oh, everyone is like, yeah, this is the truth. Well, yeah, look how many people are flocking out of the Orthodox and the Catholic and mm -hmm. all of that and, and going to, you know, Bible-believing churches and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, we, we got to always keep the, uh, uh, the sense of proportion. But, yeah, they make very grand claims of this is the church that's been here from the beginning. And obviously that's, that's appealing, that, that notion, you know, sure. to— to people, and like I say, people get um, sometimes. Oh, it can be a number of things that turn them off of uh, conventional Protestantism. But of course, it's the same with the Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, they've grown enormously. And again, people from the Catholic, from the Protestants, from Orthodox, mm -hmm. convert mm -hmm. to Jehovah's Witness. It, it proves nothing that people, you know, it proves maybe you're doing a good job of evangelism, of you know, of proselytizing. But it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't prove anything as to who who has truth or doesn't have truth and of course unfortunately nowadays the biggest growing group are the the nuns the nuns you know they don't belong to any religion when they put in you know in a survey what what church you belong to they should click none you know yeah you know yeah. um and, and so um that's probably the the biggest obstacle facing all of christianity today to all of the groups you, you mm -hmm. know that that um um Christianity, people are being attracted to the world and, and losing losing faith. Not so much in the Anabaptist world, uh, thankfully. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we have some, but it's it's mainly out of the other churches, including from the Orthodox, the Catholic, the the mainstream Protestants, and that that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's good perspective. Um, yeah. So in 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 some takeaways for this podcast, I feel like um, maybe some reading more of the Ananising Fathers wouldn't be amiss. I feel like I, I it's a good encouragement for me to hey, what what does this stuff say? You know, uh, and also too, I'm just finding you know your your story of joining the church as you leave Jehovah's Witnesses and um, and things. You know, it was a bit circuitous at points, but you were like you were trying, you were searching, you were you know and and you learned a lot along the way and you didn't give up on that and i think that's a really important lesson here a lot of people give up on the church yeah and just say you know uh oh, forget it it's not for me you yeah know? and and you didn't do that you know you're yeah. here you know and that's yeah. important yeah it's um and there's been disappointments um and the grass can look greener other, other places you, you know um but um i th i'm glad because of growing up Jehovah's Witness, I did understand non-resistance in the two kingdoms. Um, they have the correct teaching on that. So I knew that's what the Bible taught. So that, I'm glad I had that as sort of a an anchor that, you know, it's so clearly in Jesus' teachings and that the Sermon on the Mount was a central teaching. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, I would mm -hmm. say, do not live it as closely as the Anabaptists, but 
at least they they preach it as something we should live by. And so I think that helped me a lot. And so, yeah, like for an Anabaptist, um, we we maybe don't appreciate enough our own heritage or even know enough about mm -hmm. it. You know, a lot of the things, some of the criticisms I've gotten, you know, on the early church, it's like the person doesn't even, it's, you know, like from a Mennonite, they don't even realize, well, this, the early Anabaptists believed the same thing. I mean, as the early church. I mean, you're criticizing not just the early church, you're criticizing mm -hmm. our forefathers because you've been so influenced by Protestants, you don't realize how much you have drifted from the Anabaptist um, realm. And I think that's one of the things that helped me and drew me to the Anabaptist world is I got acquainted with them first, not from meeting them, but from reading Menno Simons, from reading Michael Sattler, from reading um, um, Conrad Grebel, and, and some of those people. I read those writings before I ever met an Anabaptist in the flesh. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, so okay. so I knew what they had taught, and I, I didn't even realize they had you know lost some of those teachings. So when I read that, I, I remember way back when I first had read the Antinicene Fathers, um, it was just like maybe six months later that I was reading all of the reformers, Luther, Calvin, and then you know I was reading the Anabaptists. I realized, whoa, bingo, Anabaptists. Okay, this is really uh, man. Th this really resonates with what the early Christians were were saying. You know, again, a few theological differences, but this big emphasis on living the Christ life. You, you know mm -hmm. that that the reformers, particularly Luther, was not teaching, and um, you know the ancient churches weren't weren't teaching and. Yeah, it's just, but maybe it's enriched my life that, yeah, there wasn't just a, a beeline from there to the Anabaptists. But at that time, there were no conservative Anabaptists in Texas at that at that time, or they were just getting started. I didn't know about them. I wasn't able to find any. So, um, yeah, that, that made the journey a lot longer, you know, <laughs> because of that, yeah. Yeah, and and you learned a lot of, you know, a lot of lessons and... Um, and you've written a lot of that stuff down, and you've made it available to others, and and I think that's a that's significant, that's important, and I just I think it's I, again I think it is really key that you didn't give up on the church through all this. You know, there there's a lot of people who do that. Um, so maybe this is just to put put that out as an encouragement for people who are out there, because we, I guess what I'm saying is we get a lot of comments on on our YouTube channel and emails and you know comments things. Um, people say I'm I'm trying to find a church, you know, and I don't I'm still figuring this thing out. And um, and you I think what you're sharing here is an encouragement to those people that don't don't give up. You know, you keep searching and don't don't give up on the church. Yeah, don't don't give up on God and don't. Um don't give up on the church. I mean, the Anabaptists, we've never claimed we're the only church or that right. we are the, the church. Yeah. But I would encourage an Anabaptist, uh, yeah, don't don't give up on the Anabaptists. Um, there are, fortunately, you know, various choices. So you might mm -hmm. be in a group that, that you feel like yeah, you're not going anywhere spiritually there, but there there are other types of Anabaptists. I, I've liked that there is that variety. It... it uh, um, it has blessed me, you know, because I know some groups I probably wouldn't fit in very well, and then others, you know, I'm I'm at a place now where you know fit in very very well, you know. Um, I'd also say if yeah, if you're an Anabaptist and and you're thinking about going to the Orthodox or the Catholics or, or something like that, um, you know, contact Scroll Publishing. I, I would be very willing to mm -hmm. just personally, yeah talk to you if, if if you're thinking of that I, i'm not going to criticize you for thinking I, I i like people who think and explore so yeah don't don't think i'm going to like oh <laughs> jump all over you like how can you think of such a horrible thing you, you know no i, yeah. I understand i understand i, I went down mm -hmm. a similar journey so I'm, I'm very sympathetic but yeah let's let's talk because there's a lot of things that you probably aren't aware of that you know you're 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 seeing certain proof texts and you're not you're mm -hmm. not seeing the whole picture mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, we'll link Scroll Publishing uh, down below, and okay. and maybe some of these other things you've referenced to the the series on infant baptism and um, some of this stuff. I think that's that is really important. I, I I'd be very curious to look at the comments on on this uh, video. I'd be curious what people think. I'm sure there'll be some some interesting feedback. But yeah, in the end, don't give up on Jesus. Don't give up on on God's people, and and keep trying, I guess, is is the word, or like, yeah, you didn't give up, and and that's commendable, and, and that's worth remembering, so. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing, David. It's a pleasure to yeah. have you on the podcast. Thank again. you, Reagan.
Thanks for listening to this interview with David Bursow. If you found this interesting, we interviewed him several times in the past, and you can find those linked in the description below. We love to hear from our listeners. So if you have any feedback or suggestions for future topics, be sure to send us an email or leave us a comment down below. As always, you can find all our content over on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. And we'll catch you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.